in um, 1985, I uh, was part of a big debate, took up the whole issue of the Journal of Parapsychology on uh, the Gansfeld effect, which I'll talk about a little bit. And uh, during that, uh, half the issue was me, and the other half was rebuttal to me by Arnton. And during my 85, 50 pages of critique of their experiments, I did the very first meta-analysis in parapsychology. I say that because this mea culpa is, I feel bad that I did that because that, as far as I know, I'm the first person to ever do a meta-analysis in parapsychology. The parapsychologist sees upon that. Hey, this is a way we can show that our results are actually replicable. And since then, parapsychologists have been doing meta-analyses all over the place. And so, uh, and I've had to, uh, more recently, write why meta-analysis, the way they're using it, is confusion of between exploratory versus confirmatory analysis. And there's no way, the way they're using it, that it is can be used as a confirmatory, and I'll explain that. Uh, analysis. So I just want to make that apology that I may have been inadvertently have unleashed a whole torrent of years and years of parapsychologists being able to think they have definitely shown that the results of parapsychological research are not only significant but fantastically replicable. And in fact, in the claim of two of the major parapsychologists, their results are even more replicable than those experiments in psychology and in physics, okay? So, that's what I wanted to say. The final result uh, of our talk, everything's cumulating. We want to have good evidence, and we give you a framework by which you can hopefully judge the quality of the evidence you're dealing with. But that usually applies to just one experiment, this conditional structure we gave you, if something is so, this hypothesis is real, as true, then we should get certain results and how you deal with that kind of a conditional thing. That applies to a single experiment. But a single experiment by itself is not sufficient to say that this is high quality data. And in science, it's recognized that you gotta keep, you gotta replicate things. Things gotta be not only replicated, but by independently replicated, by different, by, by your rivals in different laboratories. If they can't get what you get, it's not science until it's public and independently replicable. And only under those conditions do you now have a basis for saying, hey, this is good data that I can think about, the use of my thinking. Um, there's one other point I come back to it. But let me uh, begin by saying that uh, I'm going to do it entirely in terms of I'm going to apply it to parapsychology. And we're going to deal with one, uh, one field of parapsychology, one kind of parapsychology experiment called the Gansfeld. G-A-N-Z-F-E-L-D. Now, by itself, the Gansfeld is a term that means a German word meaning the entire field, in the say. But it was applied by psychologists to a situation where if you put people into a, um, uh, like put ping pong balls over their eyes. You can do it a lot of ways, but the standard way now is you take ping pong balls and cut them in half, you know, plastic, you know, and then take those half balls over, over the eyes of a person, and then shine a bright light in front of it, sometimes it's a pink light, but sometimes a white light will do. And the person sitting in the chair, reclining and looking at that, they, it's, the world becomes, because you're taking away, the reason the psychologists are interested in this is because perceptual psychologists have always thought that perception depends upon seeing edges and contours, uh, to, to, to see the world without edges and, and, uh, and uh, borders and stuff like that, you shouldn't see anything. And that turned out to be true. They figured out how to do that, creating what's called the Gansfield field. When people are put in that state, everything becomes like walking in a fog. 
There's no objects anymore, everything was foggy. And after a while, you get into what's called an alternate state of reality, pleasant one even. They, they usually, at the same time, put the sounds of ocean sounds in your ear or just white noise. And with this like this thing here, within a few minutes, people get into what they think is a very satisfactory altered state. The parapsychologists picked up on that because they said, hey, they're always looking for ways of uh, making their experiments more reliable. But, you know, every time you do parapsychological experiments, they're very difficult to reproduce. They're very, it's very difficult to do in the first place to get consistent data. And their story is that the reason for it is that dealing with psychic phenomena, uh, you're also in a world where you've got regular sensory input. And the sensory input is interfering with picking up the delicate size signals. So if we can get rid of that, somehow suppress the uh, ordinary sensual input, we can enhance the size signal. So that's why they latch onto this as a possible way of solving all their problems. Because for them, their problems are that they're dealing with a very subtle uh, ability, which is very, very delicate and, and very uh, uh, erratic, and it's very hard to demonstrate scientifically. So they developed what they call the Gonsfeld Psi Experiment. And the first one was published in 1974 by Charles Arnotton and I forget her name, he had an, a, 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 a co-writer, co-author, but he is the key person in this and I will put him down here then. So 1974 begins the era of the Gansfeld Psi experiments. And to this very day, 1974, it's the longest consistent data uh, uh, kind of experiment that parapsychologists had in its hundred, more than 150 years of trying to be a science. This is, for them, the longest thing that's lasted before it became dissolved and became, they gave up on it. But 1977, when I first got involved with it, uh, Paul Kurtz, you may have heard of, was the editor of the Humanist magazine. And in, by, that, by that time, he was beginning to write, by 1976, you remember, is the um, uh, first, uh, that when Psychop was formed, and Paul Kurtz and Marcello Trizzi were the co-directors, uh, and finally uh, Kurtz became the head of the whole enterprise. But 1977, he had uh, Martin Gardner and myself uh, debate a parapsychologist by the name of Scott Rogo about ESP. And mostly the debate was, Martin did a general article, and I, I, and I was in the direct debate with uh, Rogo, I think. And Rogo used the 1974 experiment on Gansol Tsai uh, to de justify the fact that we now, we parapsychologists now have a obviously replicable, he said he certainly had no doubts it would be replicable, but a, a true scientifically done, correctly done, uh, significant experiment, which, uh, and I, for the first time, went, back, went and read that experiment very carefully, and I found problems with it. You can find problems with any experiment, but this one was serious, I thought. For one thing, here's how they did these experiments, and they still do them that way. In a Gansfeld Psi experiment, um, they have a room where they put a uh, recipient, let's say this is the recipient, okay, and lying in a chair, right, reclining, made very happy, okay, and then uh, they put these ping pong balls over their eyes and they have a bright light shining into the eyes. And um, maybe into the ears they're putting in uh, uh, white noise. And that is the precipient. Okay, 
And that person is isolated in the room with the experiment. In this case, it could be Arnotin, okay? The experiment's in the room. They're in a room shielded from the rest of the world, more or less. They're in this room. And often another room is the sender. Could be another part of the building, but it's supposedly set, separated from another. And the sender, uh, through another procedure, the sender's sitting at a table, you're sitting down, and looking at a target, okay, which is usually a picture of some sort, photo maybe, it's sort of the target. The target has been selected from a set of four, randomly, by some random process, by some blind process, and so this person now ends up with one of four of the four targets that belong to a set. So the set consists of four targets, and one of the targets is randomly selected for the for sender to be, pay attention to, to focus on it. While this guy is in the, or she, or he, or is in the so-called Gansfeld state. While this person is uh, in that state, and this person is staring at this target, this person is encouraged to mentate. To, what they meant by that is to, to say anything that comes to mind, whatever they see or feel, you know. And so they talk for about 15 minutes, and there's a transcript made there. But the important thing is, after the session is over, about 15 minutes or so, they take off the guy's uh, ping pong balls and they shut the light off and wake him up if they have to or get him to sit up. And Now, someone takes, this person doesn't come there, but someone takes the target, puts it back in the set here, and the whole set of targets is brought into the room and shown to the recipient. Got it so far? So far clear? So the Pacific now is given four targets. One of them was the actual target, and the other are the foils for this experiment. So the Pacific has to decide on the basis of his or her feelings during that session which one was closest to what they were coming to them, the images coming to their mind, which one best matched it. And they have one chance in four of being correct just by chance. Does that make sense? Okay. Someone said no, and someone said yes, okay. <laughs> but if done right, if they randomize correct and so on, that should be the case. So over a number of, of, of trials, uh, one-fourth of them, if it's nothing but chance going on, one-fourth of them will be correct, and three-fourths will be un incorrect. So 25% is the chance level. And they compare that with the actual level they got. In this case, they got something like 33% correct. Okay. Now, any number is possible to get just by chance in an experiment like this. So we get into what is true in physics, psychology, and everything else, many fields, because most of our data is probabilistic. We use statistical testing. You've heard of null hypotheses, maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't. Uh, at this point, most people go to sleep. Okay. Uh, for whatever reason, our minds were not made to handle the probability and statistics and stuff like that. And I, as both a psychologist and a statistician, know this. I know uh, I had to help all my colleagues and my students. It was very difficult because most of them go into psychology because they want to avoid statistics and probability and stuff like that. But it's essential to doing experiments. We need this. So they used a proper statistical test and they decided that this was significant. That's the basis of all, probability, all parapsychology. Almost everything you've done in parapsychology depends upon comparing a outcome of trials against what you expect by chance. And uh, sometimes their outcomes are significant, as they call it, and sometimes they're not. They're hoping to get significant results. And here they got a significant result. And although it doesn't look big, 33% turned about robust enough so that they felt they conclude that something more than chance was going on here. And if they had done everything, this is the problem with doing parapsychological research, if they had control for every other possible uh, ways that this person could give you right, and it's not chance, they eliminated chance, then it's got to be psi. That's the way they do it. 
But you already can see the major problem of all doing parapsychological work. You're trying to eliminate all kinds of possible reason, reasons why something could be above chance without there being something psychic there. And um, so the, the problem they have, they have to be perfect. They have to have a very well-controlled experiment where they made sure that there's no other alternative explanation. Very difficult to do, and these guys have been doing this for years and stuff. They're very clever. They sometimes have good, good training, stuff like that. The thing I discovered when I just read their paper very carefully was that everything's done as I told you, except the fact that when this target is being viewed by this guy here, uh, there's no control over whether he touches it or, or she touches it, whoever the sender is. In fact, the sender is encouraged to hold the target to deal with it. Now that target's placed back in that pool, can you see anything wrong with this? It's the exact same object? Yeah. They could have bent the corner? Yeah, anything. If it's deliberately, they, these two were in cahoots with one another, uh, this person could bend the corner or do, leave a subtle mark on it. Uh, or uh, inadvertently, just handling it could smudge it in some way. Or if they, if it's very close in time, it could be somewhat warmer than these, depending on the material of it. So, and in other words, there are part, there are not necessarily plausible, but there are possible non-paranormal means by which this person may be getting better than than than, than chance successful results, picking what, what, what which of these four was the target. And the parapsychologists themselves have the have uh, since J. B. Ryan made this important because they want to be scientifically acceptable they said if there's any possible normal means even though it's not e not even implausible but possible we cannot call this a successful psychic experiment we've got to make sure that we've eliminated any plausible non-psychic means for 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 there to be a transmission well this was obviously not this would make would, would fit in with Ryan's and other parapsychologists think that this is not an acceptable experiment, just because it was this possibility. We don't have to say that it was what caused it, but Occam's razor and other things say, well, if there's a normal explanation for something, why push for a paranormal one, right? Uh, okay. So there was a controversy about that, and uh, uh, Arndt is had this over, we had year, over other similar fights like that. Arnton said, well, Ray, look, he said in the literature even, he says, you're claiming that this was the cause rather than side. I didn't claim that at all. I just said that, that by your own standards, when you do have, there is a possibility of non-paranormal means for this person to pick up information, that doesn't, isn't an acceptable side experiment by your, your own standards. His argument was, Ray, you have to prove that, in fact, that was the reason that this person did better than chance. Shifting the onus of proof, which is a very favorite example, they always doing that, that we should, and, and many times, skeptics fall into this trap. That's one of the things I know all the time, over and over again. Skeptics are always falling into the trap where they make such standard claims about how this guy cheated, they, they, it puts the onus on them now to prove that he actually cheated that way. And that means that many of the fights uh, that skeptics get involved in, they have put themselves in a position where they are supposedly uh, having to defend their, what they, their, their claim rather than the psychic who's making the claim. Uh, and uh, even I have sometimes get into that, get into that thing, uh, as I'll point out a little later maybe. But it's easy to get into the trap where you're a fa in fact, I might, should have even could have kept quiet about this and said nothing about it because I get into a situation I, when I, once I made, I pointed that out as a possible flaw in the experiment, they're demanding that I prove that it actually was the cause of the result. That's not my, my the, the bonus of onus should always be on the person making the claim, a very, very, very strange claim that in fact, there's a psychic means, which most scientists don't accept, by which this person was getting the information. Well, well, I'm not blaming them for wanting to be right. You know, a lot of people want to be right. Uh, I, I like to be right sometimes, too. Well, what's the purpose of the null hypothesis? What's that? Close off all other possible explanations. So we 
when you come up with a possible explanation, they, it's actually on them because they're conducting the experiment. That's how you. I'm, I'm not sure I got your point. So that's I the point. purpose of the null hypothesis. They close off all yeah. possible. Well, yeah, the null hypothesis, there's a lot of questions about even the null hypothesis testing in many cases, and as opposed to having this really Not parapsychology, it's interesting. In most science, null hypothesis is a straw man. We set them up, and, but, but no one actually believes that it's real. Mm -hmm. But we, 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 we want to, it's, it's better, many people say, it would be much stronger evidence if instead of having a null hypothesis, we, we compared plausible hypothesis against one another. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so it's a big fight, there's a big theoretical fights as to whether, whether the null hypothesis is good or not. In the place of parapsychology, a null hypothesis actually makes sense in some ways because uh, uh, we really, you really believe if there is uh, no such thing as psychic phenomena and everything else is controlled, on the average, the null hypothesis should be true. However, uh, there are other reasons why you, this null hypothesis could be false, and that is because the statistical models we use are really perfect models of what the environment is doing. And as a result of that, when you have a lot of what we call too high power, you can get a significant result, even when null hypothesis is true if you, in pure form, because the statistical model is very likely only a good approximation. It's good enough when you have reasonable data. But that's another thing, we, I don't want to get into that at the moment, we don't have time anyways. But anyways, I want you to understand what the Gunsfeld hypothesis was like because um, around 1980, see we started in 1974, 1980, I got requests from the IEEE, that's the International Engineering Journal or something like that, major journal, to write a tutorial for them on parapsychology from a skeptical viewpoint, because they had already published uh, a paper by Targ and Putoff on their research with Geller and on their research on remote viewing. And that got a tremendous backlash from engineers all over the world saying, this, first of all, this doesn't belong in our journal, but secondly, it's embarrassing for our whole profession to have such bad research. And so they thought to calm the waters a little bit, if they had someone like me write a lengthy article on the other side. That might appease everyone. So in order to do that, I figured I better f follow my own maxim. And if I'm going to tackle and uh, criticize the field of parapsychology as of 1980, I don't want to look at it at the bad psychological experiments. I want to look at it at its best. So I want to follow my idea of if I'm going to tackle attack someone's field, I want to look at the best they have. And I asked around in 1980, I asked, I actually went and contacted parapsychologists, including Charles Lawrence, and I said, okay, you guys, if I'm going to evaluate the field of parapsychology, I can't look at all of it. By then, there were thousands of papers published in parapsychology. There's no way I could do that in a reasonable amount of time. But tell me what the best papers are, what your best paradigm is in parapsychology. What, what do you think, and I want to look at your very best, and if I can, find that your best doesn't work, I don't have to worry about the rest, okay? So they unanimously almost picked the Gansfeld experiments. By then, there had been a lot of Gansfeld experiments done, all many of them supposedly successfully replicating the original one. And so I contacted Oniton and I asked him, how can I get hold of most of these experiments? Because they're in journals that I didn't have access to necessarily. And he was so pleased that I was a known skeptic like myself is going to take them so seriously. He said, look, I will make sure I'll get you every published paper, including the unpublished ones. And sure enough, I was now then at Stanford for a year. I had the spook chair at Stanford. So in 1982, arrived on my desk at Stanford was a 400 pages of documents in a big box. He said, as far as I know, this is every experiment published and unpublished, half of them not ever published, that has ever been done in Paris on the Gansfeld effect. And there it is. And I was overwhelmed, but I had all the pages to go through, and I began quickly scanning them first, and I was impressed in the wrong way, maybe. I was, first of all, I knew many of the names on the papers. They were 
well-known parapsychologists, who I had some respect, I knew they had some scientific training. Many parapsychologists have PhD in regular sciences like physics and um, uh, sometimes biology and sometimes psychology. And uh, they, for one reason or other, become parapsychologists, but they have some good scientific training. And several of them had, were the authors of these papers papers, and some I didn't know. And they all seemed to be significant. And according to Arnerton's count, um, of the, there, he, there were 42 separate experiments, some by se the same author, me, 42 separate experiments, and I think something like 75% um, or something like that were significant, had produced significant results. That's what we call a vote counting method. In other words, you just count the number of significant studies if you're trying to really, really that was before they had meta-analysis. And that's, uh, everyone realized that's not always necessarily the best way of judging a field. But as I, I been, began doing that, but then I began spending more time reading them very carefully, and I kept finding, you know, these guys should know better. They're, doing, they're using the wrong statistical tests, or they are not randomizing. They should know by now that you should, with man ta good tables of random numbers uh, and also random number generators on computers, they can, you don't have to shuffle by hand anymore, which is not considered an adequate method of randomization. And uh, they were doing other things. I said, well, you know, I'm going to get into arguments about this because a lot of this is subjective. They, they didn't look like they were doing the right controls and stuff like that. But I said, I'm going to get, and I did. I got into a, my first time I made a small report. Uh, Arnerton argued with me, people argued me that, the, that I'm, I'm misreading and I, it's not, the, not that way. I thought that I would reduce what I did now to uh, yes, no. Did they, uh, did they use the right test? Yes or no? That seems to be black and white. Did they randomize, did they say that they had used standard randomization methods or not? Did they do this now? And they come up with eight yes, no type of things I could apply to each paper, uh, maybe 10. Five uh, had to do with statistical problems, and five had to do with uh, experimental methodological problems. I thought that would be on them. I, and I, when I applied that, every single one of the 42 studies had at least one, and most had several of these flaws. And well, by my way of understanding parapsychologists themselves and their methodological uh, uh, things that even one of the flaws that I had found would be sufficient to dis, um, uh, to invalidate that study, to, to take it out of the pool. That created a huge backlash, and Arnerton uh, accused me of all kinds of things, and we got into a not a very nice fight to some extent, although we tried to be civil sometimes, but got very uncivil, and it, it culminated ultimately in 1985, the whole issue of the Journal of Parapsychology, which is the major journal in the field. Okay, Journal of Parapsychology. They devoted that, a whole issue, to the debate between Arnold and myself. They allowed me to write a paper as long as I wanted, and I think it was about 50 something plus pages, where I listed all the problems I found with these, these studies and stuff like that. And I also did a meta-analysis, as I said, the first meta-analysis done in the field. And I concluded that this was, you know, the, none of the, the, the amount of uh, flaws, the number of flaws and stuff like that should discount this whole entire field, uh, this whole entire batch of studies. It's called, this is now called the original Gansfeld database. Arnton replied, it took a year and a half to reply to my paper, and during that time I was not allowed to change or do anything with my paper. But he got various experts and statistics, and he got a, lot of, a bunch of people to advise him, and he wrote a, a lengthy, over 50-page rebuttal of my thing. And I wasn't allowed to rebut in that same issue. In most psychological journals, if someone criticizes an article, the uh, the author of the article being criticized has the uh, uh, privilege of writing a short but a, but a, but a, a response to the, rebut, to the criticism. I wasn't allowed to do that then. They said in the future she might do it, but not that issue. So the whole issue was taken up with this debate. 
And what happened was, as you can imagine, is that uh, after this, pub this journal was published, the parapsychologist said, well, Arnerton demolished Hyman. His critique just showed that Hyman got it all wrong and he's biased and everything else. The skeptics, all the people in Psychop, all the skeptics in the world, said Hyman showed that those guys don't know what they're doing. <laughs> he really exposed them. And I dawned on me that, hey, no one's ever going to do what Anderson and I did. We were looking at the nitty gritty. We were looking at each experiment and, and figuring out the raw data. Did that experiment go right and so on? And no one, even the parapsychologists in the right mind, is going to take the time that we took to do that. They just, so all the parapsychologists, this is called attribute substitution by kind. Remember we mentioned that? Instead of going on themselves and looking and doing all, this, all the hours and months of work that Arnerton did and I did, going over these papers and, and seeing whether they really are flawed or not, they're going to take Arnerton's word for it if they're parapsychologists, which is, in other words, they're substituting the actual problem uh, with, with a simpler one, which is simply take Arnerton's word for it. And my friends, or people on my side, were taking my side. And I realized that no one's going to know, literally, who is right, except, except that those who uh, are on my side are just going to trust me and take my word for it. And, gonna, and so I decided, after I'd written a 80-page, now rebuttal to, to Arnerton's rebuttal of me, then <laughs> uh, the journal was going to publish it, but they're going to let Arnerton now reply to that other one. So there's going to be another whole journal in 1986 or something like that. And at that time, I happened to meet Arnton at a convention I was at. And uh, someone talked to us into going to lunch together. We did. And Arnton was practically crying. He says, how did you say all those mean things about me and your rebuttal to me? Basically, he was very upset with what I said, was saying. I says, I didn't say anything. What mean things I say? He said, well, you said that I was wrong in this and this and this. And I said, you were. <laughs> and it's just factual. Look, it, it, and to me, it was factual. To him. It wasn't somehow I was insulting his integrity and stuff like that. I wasn't being mean. I, I, I wrote a paper on proper criticism. I tried to follow my rules. But for some hour, he seemed to be very hurt. And I was hurt, I said, because what you were saying in his rebuttal, uh, he, what he said to me, he, he accused all kinds of things that he had did, he accused me of doing. And so um, we had this discussion during lunch. But as we talked, I learned that he more and more I realized that we were agreeing on a lot. It turned out that he was agreeing with, to my surprise, he was agreeing with me, yes, until this whole batch of the original experiments do get replicated with cleaner experiments, we got to withhold judgment on whether we've got something here or not. I said, that, I agree with that, that's fine. So I said, okay, I'll take back my paper, I've made this proposition to him, and we'll write a joint paper, which we did in 1986. We wrote a joint communique which essentially said, look, at the moment, there's not data in the da Gansel database, has enough problems that it really doesn't support the reality of Psi. And in the future, uh, the if they're going to produce things that do support the reality of Psi, this is the criteria they should meet. Okay. Uh, so that was hailed by all kinds of people said, hey, here's this, these two combatants suddenly agreeing on something, putting out a joint paper. Isn't this wonderful? Lovey-dovey and the world is great. Uh, but uh, later, uh, uh, on, meanwhile, uh, uh, Arnerton began a, a number of experiments. Actually, he had begun them before we wrote that communique. And they are called the Otto Gansfeld experiments. Today out there, that's okay. Uh, and unless you're psychic, you wouldn't have been able to see that, okay? Uh, and the Otto Gonsville experiments were ones he did, uh, and they got published in parapsychology journals before he died. He unfortunately died rather young. And um, but by then, Daryl Ben, you may have heard of him. He's the guy who brought you feeling the future and stuff like that. We talked about him a little bit. Daryl Ben. Uh, a well-known, recognized, uh, and, and revered field, a person in the field of social psychology had, in his later years, also become a parapsychologist, as I mentioned. 
And he had told Arnton, he hadn't done any parapsychology work himself, but he told Arnton, if you do a series of experiments, which by my criteria are right and so on, and get the re good results, I will sponsor them for you and make sure that the major journal, uh, psychology journal will publish it. Because with my name on it, the major journal will publish it. And when Arnton came out with these Otto Gansfeld experiments, Ben uh, co-authored the article with Arnton, and then Arnton died before they actually published it. And that was in the, I think it was the 1994 Psychological Book, which is a major prestigious journal in psychology. And not also made a big splash like later in one of Ben's, because here was a paper on parapsychology supporting it with the, uh, a major psychologist uh, being one of the co-authors. And uh, I was asked, I not only was a referee on it, but I was also asked if I would write a, at the same issue that this would appear, if I would write a commentary on it. So the article appeared, and the article said that the Otto Gansfeld experiment definitely established the reality of Psy, no question about it, supports the original experiments that Heinemann had criticized, and shows that Heinemann's criticisms, even whether they were valid or not, didn't really affect the reality of the results, and uh, we all should bow and, and, and pray and so on. Yeah. So in my criticism, I pointed out that, hey, this experiment uh, was not a replication. In fact, it was a failed replication. I was puzzled by the fact that they were touting it as the, as uh, having replicated results. Because the Otto Gansfeld experiment considered, consisted of two kinds of tar exper uh, uh, sub-experiments. In some experiments, the targets were targets like in the first Gansfeld experiment. They were pictures, static pictures. We call them static targets. But they also in in introduced, in some half the trials, uh, dynamic targets, as they call them. These were video clips rather than fixed pictures with actual sounds and stuff like that, like an airplane flying and with sounds or other things like that, short video clips. And those were the targets. Turned out that on the static targets, and they did several experiments, so it was several hundred trials, it was a big experiment. On the static trials, it was just, the results were just a chance. On the dynamic trials, results were fairly high, and the, mix, the average one was, again, about 35% hitting. Remember, it was 33% in the original set of experiments. Uh, in the original experiment, and, and about the same in the, uh, uh, the whole set of original experiments. So, <clears throat> this is, on the basis of that, I won't go into all the details, on the basis of that, uh, Ben said, these are the best experiments done according to the best standards, and there it is. And I, in this case, I wrote to Ben, because Arnton had died, I said, could I have access to the original data? Not just the published data, but I want the actual numbers and stuff like that. And he said, well, I don't have it all. But he finally gave me, sent me uh, over the web, he sent me uh, much of the data, uh, for some of the data for all of the people participating in the, I think it was only 400 subjects or something like that, and all the experiments, the combination of experiments. And I did various analyses on it. I didn't have all I wanted. Uh, he, somebody, somehow he couldn't give me all of it. He, or he didn't give me all of it anyway. And I found rather peculiar uh, relationships. For example, all the, the significance was to the dynamic targets. I'll just tell you one little, little, little of the several flaws I found in the data, looking at the raw data. You couldn't find that from the published data. That on each experiment, each experiment with the video clips, let's say these are the video clips, four video clips, one is taken and putting in a, into a projector to, 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 uh, to project it, uh, uh, and uh, it's put into the video projector and projects, and then it's put back, and, and then uh, the, all four of these are played for the recipient, recipient, and he or she picks which one they thought most closely matches what they were experiencing during our Gansfeld state. Now, what I found was that every time a target for the first time in a pool here, a pool of four of these, had been used in an experiment for the first time, 
all those trials were just a chance. When they were used, uh, when the trial was, a, a, a target was used for the second time, every time it was used at the second time during the experiment, it was a little better than chance. And it went, see, went up almost linearly, just un uncanny, that the more times a particular target had been used before it was presented, uh, the more likely it was to be picked by chance. And that was striking. So just a lot of things like that I found in it. And I thought it, was, it should be enough to bother Ben. Ben's response to mine, because he had the final response in this case, his response was, let's say you're interested in what Hyman claims. If we find that, continually find that same phenomenon, we're going to call it the Hyman effect. <laughs> and be the new, new, new finding in parapsychology. What I was trying to say, I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to get into the, uh, that kind of an argument at that point because I felt it's their, their problem to, to, to fix. What I was pointing out is that we know that when you play, continue to play a videotape over and over again, there's some degradation. And it suggests here that maybe this was enough to give a clue because the first time it was played, it never was chosen. But later on, the more it was played, the more likely it was to be chosen. And the more likely it was to be degraded a little bit. Okay, so, but anyway. That, that was then, and then, uh, uh, oh, by the way, the reason I said I also didn't think this was replication because all the original database, the original Gansel experiments were worth static targets, right? And now the same kind of targets have been used in all those original experiments, but no longer in the big experiment, didn't show any significant results. So in that sense, it wasn't the same. It, it, by literal meaning of replication, they weren't replication of the original results. It was a new kind of ta target that hadn't been used before. And um, uh, so I'll just jump to the present to today, to, well, to 2010, Psych Bulletin again. This time, some parapsychologist led by a man named Storm and, another, and some of his colleagues in Australia, he's a well-known parapsychologist, he did a meta-analysis of all the Gansfeld experiments from the very beginning, but also since uh, the psychology, psychological bulletin, when there have been several more since then. So all the experiments, he did a big meta-analysis and found that, wow, significant. Even though, despite Hyman having shown that over time, the meta-analysis, what they call the effect size, right from the beginning, the original experiment, Remember we said 33%. The sizes were going down. However, by having bigger sample sizes, I mean the, the hit number of hits were going down, uh, it was still significant. So it looked like they were over time is, is, is coming down right to chance. Not quite because at the end, the last thing, it looks like some come, it's coming back a little bit. So they call it, they call it a rebound. But a, even so, over time, what's called the effect size has been going down from 1974 uh, to the present, okay? And um, so I pointed out, you know, among other things, like some previous criticisms, that in any sensible science, first of all, they reject the idea, which everyone thinks of right away, the, uh, well, because of criticism and stuff, they've been improving their methodology. And with improving methodology, the effect is disappearing, right? So the normal idea is that they, what they were getting was because of poor methodology, but they, they reject that, of course, for what, they have different reasons why. But I say, and also they reject the idea that it's gonna eventually settle at zero because he says in this latest one, the storm and so on, that it's a very little blip, he says that's significant. In other words, that it's coming back again, it's rebounding. Um, so it isn't going to stabilize at zero. I point out, though, that look, in any normal science, as you improve your methodology, you get rid of the errors before, and things become better and better, and you should, every science, you should expect an increasing effect size, because you're reducing errors. So even if it's still significant in some sense, a decreasing sex size is a degenerative type of science, according to many people. But anyway, so that's the thing. Uh, there are other things to say about this, but the main criticism I had is that parapsychologists 
even if he could take the what he do, what they do is they take the average of the effect sizes. Now, what do you mean by effect size? I don't mean, I mean to be too technical. They don't measure 33 percent. What they do is they because some experiments may have different number of targets. So instead of measuring the percentage of hits, they take what's called the uh, a uh, the the difference between the magnitude of the guesses. Uh, in one, one size against the magnitude that expected by chance, and they divide it by what's called a standard deviation. It's a way of getting rid of metrics. So it becomes a non-metric type of measure. So the, so the effect size is kind of um, just a, a, a abstract size of a difference, discrepancy between uh, the null hypothesis and, 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 the, uh, the, and the outcome. But it, it, could be for, it, it can mean anything. In this case, for example, if you take the original the Gaudi-Ganso experiments and you take that 35% and, and measure it and take it into effect size, it's going to be about the same effect size as the original Gaudi-Ganso experiments were, even though the original Gaudi-Ganso experiments are not a replication of, and this is not a replication of that because it's, it's a different, but you, that's wiped out, that's, that's, that's hit by the fact that you're now just using these uh, non-metric measures so you can combine different experiments. And later on, uh, from Don, the original Otto Gonsville experiments, a parapsychologist at Rhine's Duke Laboratory, David Broughton and his colleagues, they spent two years replicating uh, all the Gonsville experiments, using the same number of subjects, doing everything the same and stuff like that, even using some of the same equipment. By then, uh, gone to the last way, but they were able to get onto this original equipment. They spent two years and got zilch, okay? At the same time, a uh, Dutch parapsychologist also spent two years uh, trying to replicate and got zilch as well. Uh, yet, these are included in this same meta-analysis because you can include it because you get an abject effect size. Even if uh, the results are different and significant, or they're not significant, but there's a little bit of effect there. Anyways, you're combining all this stuff in, in an abstract way, uh, you can get anything that way. And this is the basis by which the parapsychologists claim, hey, we now have not only good data, we've been able to independently replicate it over a period of now 30 plus years. Uh, this is pseudo-replicability. It confuses the thing. First of all, the meta-analysis is after the fact. You pick it and you also have to decide what, what to include, what not to include. And it's always an interesting subjective problem. You know the results that you're putting into it. It's not double blind, it can't be, because that's how you gotta pick them. And um, it's a after the fact type of thing. And uh, it confuses me, uh, what we would call confirmatory with exploratory data. So it's a good idea for exploration purposes to go back and take old experiments, combine them if you can in an abstract way, and get a range of what the real effect size should be, emphasize an old one. That's okay to do if you realize this is a, a exploratory type of thing. It's not a way you can draw conclusions. Statistically, there's a lot of good reasons why you can't do that. And uh, use it as a hypothesis to do a, a real repeatable experiment. Now, your hypothesis should be, okay, with this number of subjects and assuming the size effect, which we guess from all the uh, analysis on the meta-analysis, we should get this. And that would be a repeatable, positive experiment. And uh, never been done. Okay. Parapsychologists have been doing meta-analysis now ever since the since I did the first one in 1985, and they've got meta coming out of their ears, and they write books with it, and then, and they use the meta-analysis, and they've never been able to prospectively predict from any meta-analysis to some new data. The only can retrospect we go back and say, hey, everything's significant if we treat it as if we didn't did it, original exploratory experiments, which they hadn't. They take old experiments and combine them together. So this is, uh, this is the one thing I want to warn you about. Replicability is important. The parapsychologists realize it, but unfortunately, in their zeal to have it, they have 
grow, resorted to a, a completely artificial creation of what I would call pseudo replicability. They don't really can never been, have yet to produce any really uh, lawful replicable experiment. Now I must say this, which is a a funny reason, a funny thing going on in the parapsychological field. There are some major parapsychologists now who agree with me that the results are not replicable. Now, how can it be parapsychologists that they agree with me that they cannot replicate their experiments? Because they say science isn't ready for this kind of stuff. Uh, we've got a, the phenomenon of Paris of Psi is so uh, elusive and so evasive you can't catch it with normal scientific methodology. And the idea of demanding this kind of replicability that science demands should be put aside for parapsychology because psi is different. And even a paper by Robert John, one of the major parapsychologists who also was the head of uh, engineering school of engineering at Princeton, uh, Robert John wrote a paper with a colleague saying uh, we should uh, change the rules. And the whole point of the article is that science got to change the rules to let in parapsychology. This is what's called begging the question in logic, though people know it. You assume because you already assume that psi is real and since it can't be demonstrated by scientific methods, then there must be something wrong with the scientific method. And um, anyway, so this is what the field of parapsychology is in now. And it's, by the way, the people who say, so I said some of the parapsychologists say we can't, we can't replicate ourselves because that's the nature of the beast. And they go back, one guy, John Kennedy, has gone so far, and he, Kennedy is actually a pretty good skeptic about the parapsychological work. He's been a, a, a thorn in their side. But he now says, he agrees that, with Hyman that uh, the results can't be repeatable, and many of the flaws that Hyman has found are real. And he said, but he says, but Hyman is wrong in saying that this means that you can't, this is not scientific. He's saying what we need he went back to William James, and I think he misinterpreted William James. William James became also as interested in testing psychic phenomenon. Uh, William James, you don't know, was a famous philosopher, but also one of the fathers of, of psychology, who in the turn of the century at Harvard wrote the classic book, which is still the best written book on psychology, except that the information he had now has been changed somewhat, but still it's a good book. Uh, so William James, uh, wrote it uh, just before he died. He spent the last 25 years of his life testing spiritual mediums and stuff like that. And he was kind of intrigued. He thought that someone, someone was real, especially Mrs. Piper, one of his favorite mediums. But at the end of his life, he wrote, uh, he said, after 25 years of doing my best to test psychic phenomena, it, it, it's still unsettled. It still hasn't gotten anywhere. I'm still the same way I was because the, the phenomena is so elusive that most of the half the time I'm thinking it's got to be a trick or it's just nothing there. Or the other half, of the, but sometimes it's so attractive, so impressive that I say, yes, yeah, something is there. But then when you look at it, it invades you. And he said, I'm sure he didn't mean it literally. He said, it's as if the good Lord uh, meant it to be this way. He's always going to tempt us to think there's something there, then pull it away. Kennedy takes that seriously, he turned out, I'm surprised, I couldn't believe it, that John Kennedy, a major parapsychologist, but some of the critic of parapsychology, he says that, in fact, that suggests to him there's a conscious type of, almost conscious-like entity or force out there that is, that is evasive and deliberately trying to uh, you know, tempt us to believe, but then pull the rug out from under us. It's always going to keep that way. And so this is a problem, but I, but I want this again, just emphasize again that replicability is the uh, goal, it's the, it's the benchmark for anything we want to do as skeptics or scientists. And if we want to think about um, dubious claims, you want to make sure that you have good quality mindware. And uh, you also have to be careful because if you're so desperate to believe something, you can imagine that you already have that good quality data and that you have already have that good replicability when 
So an outsider, and even to people in the same field, if parapsychologists, you don't have that replicability. Uh, so half the field of parapsychology, I don't know if it's exactly half, but some major parapsychologists claim they have replicable data. Some other major parapsychologists who believe just as strongly in the reality of psi believe they do not have replicable data and they never will be able to have replicable data. And uh, so you want to avoid those kind of pitfalls as well. So I hope uh, that I at least got you started. I hope I've uh, got you to think a little bit more about this issue of how we think about dubious claims. And I hope you will not waste your time thinking about dubious claims if you're doing it on the basis of bad data. Thank you.